We humans need to open our minds to the personhood of non-human animals. Why Catholics should use preferred gender pronouns and names. These are two articles by Father Daniel Horan or Father Dan Horan. He is a Franciscan priest, publishes the National Catholic Reporter. And I would like to dive into these articles and talk about them because I'm doing a lot of research for my book on liberal Catholicism and how it strays towards the edges of orthodoxy and threatens to run over headlong over a cliff. And none of us want to have that happen. So we're going to jump into it and, and talk about this today. Father Horan has also written uh, several books, one academic book. Uh, he's also written, uh, I think, I forget the title right off the top of my head. I think it's a white Catholic's guide to racism. He promotes modern, anti-ra- modern anti-racism, not just the church's longstanding condemnations of racism, but a modern perspective on it that in many respects is incompatible with things that the Catholic Church teaches. Uh, now, I'll get into that in a future episode. Uh, I'll be addressing that in my book as well. But today I want to talk about these articles um, that he's written. So if you're not familiar with Father Dan Horan, uh, he's basically a Franciscan Father James Martin. I'm sure Father Dan would consider that a compliment. Other people, not so much. So let's jump right into it. Uh, The first one is on animal ethics. It says, we humans need to open our minds to the personhood of non-human animals. All right, so what does that mean here? What's the argument here? What is he talking about? And what's hard here is that he will say things that are that are true, and this happens a lot in more liberal kinds of Catholicism, and also in conservative types of Catholicism that go a bit too far away from what the Church teaches. It will start with something that that is true, and then press the point so hard you've suddenly veered off into error. Uh, so he talks about how uh, we are composed of the environment, right? You know, we are we're stardust, you know, as Carl Sagan would say. A less romantic way to put it would be we're, we're nuclear waste, right? The carbon that comes from the nuclear reactions and stars makes up our bodies. We are united to creation. We are part of it. That's absolutely true. Uh, and so he writes here, Too often we humans live as if everything is about us and all non-human creation is intended for us to do with as we please. No, uh, creation is not intended for us to do as we please, but we are called to be stewards. And creation itself, it isn't for us primarily. It's actually for God. This is what was hard for me reading this article, which actually was disappointing because he talks about how we need to take care of animals, that animals have a lot of uh, particular traits that appear uh, person-like or people have have discovered. But he doesn't make any strong case that animals are persons. And I think Father Haran would, would have to admit No, non-human animals are not made, I don't know if this is his exact stance or not, I would ask him, are they made in the image and likeness of God? If they are, then why don't we baptize them? You know, shouldn't we we baptize uh, mentally handicapped infants who may never reach a rational stage of awareness, but we baptize them not because of what they can do, but because of what they are. So if Father Haran is going to say that non-human animals are persons, is he going to go full throttle and say, yeah, we should baptize them? I don't, I don't know. You'd have to you have to ask him. But he goes through here, and mostly he just says other academics have taken this seriously, so we should too. Well, I have questions about these academics. Uh, Catholic theologians such as St. Joseph's sister Elizabeth Johnson, the emerita professor at Fordham, uh, you know, writing the book Ask the Beast, Darwin, and the God of Love. Already right off the bat, I'm not happy about the citation. Sister Elizabeth Johnson uh, is a controversial theologian. I think she's a uh, feminist theologian. And the USCCB criticized a book she wrote about the nature of God in 2011. And this is what they said about that book. They said, it's right here, the problem is not that, Sister Johnson's book, that the book attempts to express the faith of the church in terms that have not been previ- not previously been used and approved. Because she was saying, the bishops don't like it, I'm using terms no one's used before. No, people come up with different terms. That's fine. Rather than repeat traditional formulas, the problem is that the language used in the book does not adequately express the faith of the church. On several points, as the committee has noted, the different language used in the book does not, in fact, convey the faith of the church. So right off the bat, I'm not impressed with the citations from Father Horan when it comes to animal personhood. I agree we should be kind to animals. We should care for them. But he goes on here saying, oh, there's people who have thought about proposing animal personhood, and there's theologians. 
But as you read through it, there's not an argument here for why we should consider certain non-human animals persons. I agree that there are non-human animals that do exhibit person-like traits. This is very evident in domestic animals, right? Think about your dog. People have relationships, you know, uh, I'm not obvious, you know, that not like they would have with people, but, you know, dogs recognize us. They say it's man's best friend for a reason. And a lot of that is because they're domesticated. They copy our our traits, kind of. C.S. Lewis even thought about this, and he made an argument for animals being in heaven. And he said that the argument would be much stronger for domesticated animals than for wild animals, because domesticated animals would imitate humans in, in different ways. But he says... Uh, each creature from the tick to the human has a relative experience of the world and meaning making. I don't think ticks make meaning of anything. Sorry, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna be able to uh, to go that far. Uh, so he, you know, he goes on, and I'm just reading through, trying to find. Okay, well, what's your definition of a person? Like, what is a person? How should we understand this? And typical of this kind of writing, we don't get that. Uh, he says we we would do well to acknowledge our interdependence with an inextricable connectedness to the rest of creation. We are creatures too, even if we would like to pretend otherwise. Well, yeah, nobody argues with that. The problem is that you you take... Oh, let me move this here, get the screen up. I'm here, let's bring this up. There we go. Yes, well, let's go to the catechism, which when you're talking about animals and persons and respect, why, why doesn't he quote from the catechism on this to give us some insight here? There's actually some pretty good stuff here, you know? Uh, and for this, I would look to paragraphs 2415 through 2418 of the Catechism. The section is respect for the integrity of creation. And so it's talking about the seventh commandment. Uh, you know, so you shouldn't steal, right? Uh, don't, don't steal from others. And that includes if you destroy the environment, you steal from future generations, for example. It's kind of theft. Uh, it says uh, animals like plants and inanimate beings are by nature destined for the common good of past, present, and future humanity. Uh, it says use of these resources can't be divorced from respect for moral imperatives. Man's dominion over inanimate and other living beings granted by the creator is not absolute. It's limited by concern for the quality of life of his neighbor, including generations to come, and respect for the integrity of creation. So 2416, it says animals are God's creatures. By their mere existence, they bless him and give him glory. Thus, men owe them kindness. So the reason we show kindness to animals is because God made animals. They exist to bless him. They are good in and of themselves. And so we care for them as their stewards. And it mentions St. Francis, St. Philip Neri, and how kind they were to, to animals. By the way, St. Francis of Assisi, read my book, What the Saints Never Said. If you do, you'll be the 12th person who's ever read it. And in there, I talk about the misquotes from St. Francis. People think St. Francis just talked to animals all day. He had a kindness for animals. We also preached about all different kinds of people who would go to hell. So will the real St. Francis of Assisi please stand up? So it says that with animals that uh, medical and scientific, exp you know, we can use animals. Our st we have stewardship over animals. Uh, God entrusted animals to the stewardship of those whom he created in his own image. That means animals are not made in God's image. We can, we're stewards of them. So it's legitimate to use animals for food and clothing, to domesticate them, to use them for medical and scientific experimentation within reasonable limits. But yeah, you just shouldn't be cruel to animals. Here's the interesting one, paragraph 2418. Very important in the modern world nowadays. It is contrary to human dignity to cause animals to suffer or die needlessly. Correct, don't torture animals. It is likewise unworthy to spend money on them, on non-human animals, that should, as a priority, go to the relief of human misery. One can love animals. One should not direct to them the affection due only to persons. So my question for Father Dan Horan is, if the Catechism says we shouldn't treat animals like persons, doesn't that make us question this thesis that non-human animals are persons? Uh, why should we believe that? Some might have very strong person-like behaviors, but they don't have moral agency. They don't have any capacity for moral agency, like us by the nature of their kind, they're not, they're not persons. Instead, we're just muddying the waters. If we understand that we are persons made in the image and likeness of God, then we must treat animals in a unique way. We don't, uh, we're not indifferent to their suffering, like other non-human animals are indifferent to suffering, but we also are not the exact same as non-human animals, because we have an immortal soul. We're made in the image and likeness of God. You should, I love this, one should not direct to animals the affection due only to persons. 
So keep that in mind if you know people that are a bit too obsessed over their pets and have got them on their third kidney transplant or something like that. That would be uh, beyond the bounds. That's affection that's due uh, only to persons. All right, and then let's go to the other one. Uh, preferred gender pronouns and names. So what's Father Haran's argument here? Why should we use preferred gender pronouns and names? He starts, names play an important role in the Catholic tradition. Celebration of baptism. First question is, what name do you give this child? Uh, religious congregations will adopt a new name for their religious professions. Uh, app, you'll have appellations like father, sister, brother, and bishop. Names are significant. Correct. It doesn't mean, though, that I have to go with every name someone says, and I especially don't need to use the incorrect pronoun. And then he tries, I guess he tries to argue that you should give respect someone's new name because Abraham became, Abram became Abraham, Sarah became Sar Sarah, you know, Sarai became Sarah, and the Gospels, the change from Saul to Paul in the Acts of the Apostles. Uh, Saul did not change his name to Paul. Uh, that was his double name. Uh, in the ancient world, it was very common to have a, a Hebrew name and a Latin equivalent, like you have John Mark, for example. So Saul was this gen was the apostle from Tarsus. Saul was his Hebrew name. Paul was his uh, Roman, his Latin name. And that's made clear in Acts. He didn't change his name from Saul to Paul because he converted. That's a common misunderstanding. But even here in these cases, you look at Abram and Abraham. Who does the name change? God. That doesn't mean then that I should always... Now, when other people just change their names, that's fine most of the time. For example, my legal name is Trenton. I stopped going by Trenton in like the ninth grade, freshman year of high school, probably 10th grade. I just stopped going by Trenton. I didn't prefer it. I liked Trent. And Father Daniel Haran, I think he says somewhere else that he likes to go by Dan. Okay, fine. And there, that's a courtesy, right? So he goes on to say, you know, calling individuals, he's like, why are people so resistant? Why do, why do they not support LGBTQ by preferred names and pronouns? He says, calling individuals by the names and pronouns they prefer is not decent and respectful. It follows from the golden rule of doing unto others what you would like others to do unto you. Uh, the problem here, though, is that the golden rule isn't infallible. The idea is treat others how you would want to be treated. Okay, well, then I could put it this way. Actually, I can do this within the golden rule. Uh, I would want people to not partake in my delusion. So if I ended up in a state where I had an identity disorder, and I think many people who identify as transgender, if they had another identity disorder, they would not want people to go along with it. Like if they thought that their legs needed to be amputated because they mistakenly think that they're paralyzed. Or uh, if you think that you are morbidly obese, even though you're dangerously underweight, People should not tell you you're overweight or obese because you are not, even if that's what you think that you are. And in some cases, a person... Now, names and pronouns, I will say. So let me go down here a little bit more, and we'll... And here he says here, I go by Dan, not Daniel. But this is not that at all. It's not like just shortening a name. It's not even just getting a, a new name or a new religious name. It, it is... The problem is that the name is tied into a false identity. Now, I am a lot more tolerant of using someone's le new name instead of a new pronoun. Because a name, there's all kinds of names out there. You know, there's so many new names that come out, I can't even keep track of them. You know, uh, this, this is my child. His name is Bran. You mean Brian? No, Bran. You mean Brandon? His name is Bran. Like, Raisin Bran? It means life. I, I don't know, but does that happen to you? You hear a name you never heard before, you're like, just go with saints and apostles. That's what we've done. It's worked out just fine. Remember, your kid's going to have that name the rest of his life. I was reading a news story recently about a, um, it said, a parent, a parent embarrassed that flight attendant made fun of her child's name. What was her child's name? The child's name on the boarding pass was spelled A, B, C, D, E. H how do you, how, this, is, this is a real, it's a real story, A, B, C. Let's see. Yeah, there we go. Uh, Tracy Redford, uh, uh, totally still, her father's name it's, is ABCD, which is pronounced Absidy. If you saw ABCDE, how would you pronounce that? Absidy. Of course. Have you, have you never used hooked on phonics? This is, in some countries, there's, only, there's a list of approved names you're allowed to use. I think we should do that here. Put it, put, 
a thousand names in it, but not A, B, C, D, E. I'll even take Absidy, spelled like this, A, B, A, B, S, I, D, E, E, but not A, B, C, D, E. Come on. So, yeah, names, come on, don't, don't sally your, but if somebody has a name like Lord Satan, you know, and they're, they're purposely trying to get a rise on me as a Christian, I'm not going to, I'm not going to call them that. I'm not going to distort reality. That's why also I don't call people who have PhDs from diploma mills doctor, because they're not a doctor. They, they have not gone through the proper accreditation process. And so the word doctor loses meaning. I'm not going to call them that. So, but he says here that refusing to call someone by their preferred name or gender is unchristian and sinful. Sinful. To not use a person's preferred pronoun or preferred name. Now, I would ask here for Father Haran, where does the church teach this, that it's sinful? And he can't do that. Instead, he just says that Muslims in China and kidnapped slaves aren't allowed to use their names. What does that have to do with what we're talking about? That's called a red herring. It's just an emotional distraction that doesn't talk about what we're, we're confronted with here. And even the way it goes, fine, I'm willing to let people have, if you want to have a name, especially that there can be gender-neutral names like Pat or Terry, all right, whatever. Pronouns I'm not going to do. That's a lie. I'm not going to lie about people. And so he goes down here, and here's where it gets interesting. He says, perhaps some kind of nonviolent civil, or maybe better put, ecclesial disobedience might help our fellow Christians. Like, he really thinks it's bad if you—let's so stick to preferred pronouns. Like, if you— a biological male who identifies as a woman, to refer to this person as he, he calls that sinful. No evidence from Scripture, tradition, the Catechism. It's just Father Haran's opinion. Why is lying? Why has not even that it's okay to lie about these things? But he's saying that it's a sin if you refuse to lie about a person's pronouns, whether they're to refer whether they're a man or a woman. And I'm sorry, no, him or her doesn't refer to gender which only exists in the mind. It refers to the objective reality of sex that exists in the real world that we can determine, whether you are a man or a woman, not your sense of male or female. And so perhaps some kind of nonviolent, civil, or ecclesial disobedience might help. What? He wants to make sure those in political, in positions of leadership and authority in the church get a taste of their own medicine. Oh no, you're going to get us. Oh no. Uh, and so what does he recommend? I do, he says here, I do wonder what it might mean for the bishops who have discouraged the faithful from using preferred names and pronouns uh, if people did that to him. Uh, I suppose the same bishop wouldn't mind if we called him her or Sister Mary instead of Bishop so-and-so. <laughs> That's going to show... The, can you, <laughs> this, this, is, this is very humorous. This idea that he thinks like, imagine if we called the bishop sister. Oh, he's going to totally lose it. People do this to me online sometimes when I talk about how I'm not going to lie when it comes to gender ideology and use incorrect pronouns. And people on social media will say, what do you think about that, Mrs. Horn? As if like that makes me upset. It doesn't because I'm a man and I know that. And I don't demand, and my sense of being male or female does not depend on me demanding that other people recognize that. Because while I'm a human being, I've got my own wounds in different areas. My wife has introduced me to a podcast called Restore the Glory. Uh, and we all have psychological, social, spiritual wounds to deal with. My wife and I always joke, you know, if something comes up and it's our past haunts us. Wounds! It's wounds! <laughs> um, but I'm not wounded when it comes to my masculinity. So you can call me Mrs. Horn all you want. I find it amusing. Other people, you call them he when they identify as she. They're upset because... They're living, they have a sexual identity disorder, and that's why they get so upset by it, because it reminds them of the identity disorder they have. And, and, I, and when I'm being laughing a little bit here, I'm not laughing at someone who struggles with gender dysphoria or a sexual identity disorder. That's sad. We should be empathetic. So when I talk to someone who struggles with these things, I'll compromise with them. I might use their new name, or at least a variation of it that's gender neutral, and I'll use a gender neutral pronoun, like they. Here's what they said, because that can be used singular, you know, that could be singular they, I'm, and I'm willing to meet them. I'm willing to meet them because they, they have an identity disorder, and there could be a lot of pain and hurt there. And so I, I feel compassion for them, but I'm not going to lie. I want to help them out of that. 
I laugh at Father Haran's arguments because he puts himself out there in defending these views. They're nonsensical. They don't make sense. And I'm going to critique that. If he wants to dialogue with me about any of these things, more than welcome to. But since the views are out in public, they're fair game to publicly criticize. Uh, and if he wants to have a dialogue with me, more than welcome to do that. But here's the thing with the bishop also. It totally backfires. You don't call a bishop sister because a bishop's title is objective, because he objectively received the episcopate from other bishops. Even if I was, let's say I was in the army, and I was arranging a peace deal with another army, and I really hate those guys, we're at war, right? I would still refer to the other guys as general, even though I hate them, because they objectively are generals. That's their rank in their respective militaries. A bishop, that is his objective title, and we know he's a bishop because we saw in the space-time universe Three other bishops lay their hands on this guy and make him a bishop. Calling me a woman is silly because I satisfy the objective tests for being a biological male. I, I think I definitely satisfy them because I have three children. How'd I do that? If I And I'm married to a woman who gave birth to these children. Pretty sure that's enough to show I'm biologically male and she's biologically female. That's, that's objective. That's indisputable. Any people on Twitter who think they can make fun of me to get under my skin, with notwithstanding, that's not going to prove anything at all. Uh, so yeah, that's his. That's basically his argument is that it hurts people's feelings, so we shouldn't do that. Yeah, and we shouldn't unnecessarily hurt people's feelings. But when we want to help people out of a disorder, when we want to help them to flee from what's disordered or what's sinful, they will rebel against that. And it can be very painful to, to do that. It, sometimes to help people, there's going to be hurt that's involved. We should never intentionally hurt people. But as we overcome, it's just like you take someone who is addicted to pornography and you tell them that pornography hurts them, that they are hurting by looking at pornography. They are hurting, participating in the abuse of women in the pornography industry. That's going to make them feel like dung. They say, you're hurting these women when you do this. But if it helps them break free of their, their sin, their use of pornography, then that's a good thing. So we should never unnecessarily hurt people, but sometimes in helping people to move towards the truth and away from sin and disorder, it may be unpleasant in that process. And we should always be as charitable as we can, but it's not charitable to just try to make people happy, because that's, that's the happy march to hell. Wide and broad is the narrow path. I'm not saying someone who merely has gender dysphoria will go to hell. What I am saying, though, is that if we only care about making people happy in this life, then we have neglected our duty when it comes to leading them to their ultimate happiness in the next life. And really, we can't. When you look at the statistics, you look at statistics for LGBTQ teens. From 2015 to 2022, depression among LGBTQ teens has dramatically increased. But acceptance of these ideologies has definitely, think about from the year 2012 or 2000 till now. Like, cultural acceptance of this ideology is much more widespread, yet depression and mental illness is even higher. Maybe it's because, and they would say, well, it's the anti, it's the homophobia, transphobia that causes the depression. What do you do, though, in other countries like the Netherlands or the Nordic countries that are very accepting, still have high rates of mental illness? Well, everybody's homophobic. Okay, that's an unfalsifiable hypothesis that you're not even willing to consider maybe these lifestyles and disordered identities are not good for the human person. Uh, so yeah, so that's what he ends up saying here. The Catholic tradition, which values the importance and powers of names and naming, is firmly committed to the inherent dignity and value of all persons. It is a continued disgrace to reject and erase the self-identities of our brothers and sisters in Christ. No, we're not rejecting identities. We firmly recognize this person is a man or woman created in the image and likeness of God who has a, is deeply wounded, and we should care for them, but we shouldn't lie to them. And what's, I would ask Father Haran, what is wrong with that? Now, in his more academic works, he claims that the male female bi is a binary that comes from Aristotle and Aquinas and has no place today, which I think his arguments aren't very persuasive. Maybe we can go to that in a, in a future episode. But I hope that that was helpful for you guys. I'm really excited to do more work on this subject, to, to publish it, and to engage these arguments because I worry that. You know, much of the teaching of the church, what's undermining it are people who identify as Catholic, who confuse people on essential teachings related to sexuality, to life, uh, and that's uh, very disheartening to see, but the truth always finds a way. Truth is like life in Jurassic Park. 
you know, uh, Jeff Goldblum, uh, life uh, uh, finds a way. Truth finds a way. Even in the darkest of errors, the truth will find a way. I hope that you will share the truth in a, a gentle yet assertive way with others. But thank you guys so much, and I hope you have a very pleasant day. Hey, thanks for watching this video. If you want to help us produce more great content like this, be sure to click subscribe and go to trenthornpodcast.com to become a premium subscriber. You'll help us create more videos like this and get access to bonus content and sneak peeks of our upcoming projects.